Hi. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm Blake Borgeson. I work with Dr. Ed Marcotte in the University of Texas at Austin. And um, rather than talk about um, software or processes, I'm going to just try to be informative about a new kind of data, a, a greater amount of data that we're trying to get at that we think is going to be really critical and helpful to being able to make these 3D models both more um, visually realistic and mechanistically accurate. And that's um, mapping out protein complexes in animals. Um, so this, this is another image from David Goodsell, and this is a, a beautiful picture of a, a human B cell that's producing and getting ready to secrete antibodies. And if you look at an image like this, you'll, you'll really find out that um, the, the interior of the cell is dominated with these protein complexes, these stable assemblies of several different proteins that come together to carry out some kind of biological function. So we've gotten very good at measuring a lot of specific entities in the cell, like genes, transcripts, proteins, metabolites. We still have a long way to go, at least in terms of animals, in terms of understanding these protein complexes and different protein interactions like this. So in yeast especially, we've mapped out complexes quite well in recent years, and I'll talk about that. Um, in humans, we think we have far less than half of these complexes that we actually know even what they are, what proteins they're made of. So how can we fix that? So how this is done currently, generally, is kind of mapping um, protein complexes one at a time. And this is a technique that's called APMS. Basically, you've got a protein of interest that I've labeled there with POI. You tag it so that you can pull it out of solution later. And then you overexpress that tagged protein in your biological sample. You hope that it forms the same complexes that the native protein does without the tag. And then you use an antibody to that, to that tag and an affinity column to pull it out of solution run it through mass spec, and that tells you all the different proteins that are attached to your protein. So you can kind of one at a time by doing these pretty intense experiments um, find out these complexes. So if you do that to a lot of different proteins, um, you'll be able to map out the, the different complexes pretty well. And that's been done pretty well in yeast. People have started trying to do it in flies and human cells, but it's, it's been a challenge and we haven't made a lot of progress yet. So what if there's a way to do this all at once instead of one complex at a time like that? And that's what we're trying to do. So the simple idea is looking for proteins that separate together in biochemical separations. So for instance, a simple example is a sucrose gradient. You separate out your biological sample in a sucrose gradient. The denser things go to the bottom, the less dense things rise to the top. And if you have proteins that are found together um, more often than you'd expect, then they're more likely to be part of a complex. And so we do a number of different kinds of separations like this, separating the sample by by size, by charge, by density like this. And um, if you do that, if you separate your sample several different ways and the proteins keep being found in the same place, it indicates that they're probably part of a complex. So that's a simple idea. Technically, the way we do this is we kind of take every slice of each one of these separations, every fraction, and run it through mass spec to quantify all the proteins in each of those slices. And then what this image is trying to represent is that we look for correlations. So if you have two proteins that are found at a similar place at a number of different separations, we call that proteins whose, whose elution profiles are correlated. And so those, those correlated proteins are more likely to be in a complex. So that's the basic idea. To give you just a bit better understanding of, of how we go about this, um, yep, the image that you can see at the top left there, that's that's real data, um, so that's a, that's a real separation, and it's several hundred proteins, and I've kind of clustered them together after the fact based on real complexes. So the one that I've blown up there is a complex called the exocyst, and there are eight proteins, and it's just to illustrate that the eight proteins in this complex, we do this separation, we find them, we find them kind of all in the same spot in that separation. So, um, so we take these big data sets, and again, we make these pairwise protein correlation scores. And we take those scores and we can use machine learning methods on them to identify um, interactions that we think are likely to be true, proteins that are likely to be in the same complex. And that makes this, this pairwise interaction map that you see over here on the bottom right. Then we can cluster those and kind of lift out the real complexes from this. And so that works, you can see it right here with the exocyst complex. One challenge with this approach is we're searching this whole space of all proteins interacting with all other possible proteins. And that space of true interactions is really sparse, so false positives is a really big problem when you're taking an approach like this. So the way we handle that is by folding in other external biological data sets. So one example is gene co-expression. 
If two genes are expressed in pretty similar patterns across a lot of different conditions, then those proteins are more likely to be part of the same complex. So using, using that and using machine learning, we can, we can get rid of the false positive problem pretty well, and this method uh, ends up working quite well. So we've done this now in human cells and published just a few months ago. And um, so with, the, with some collaborators, Andrew Emily in Toronto and Elizabeth Tellier and Alberto Pacanaro. And we've kept doing these experiments on a larger and larger scale. And now we have a lot more of this data from several different species. So it's been tons of mass spec experiments. But what that gives us is the ability to really see a lot of what's going on biologically. So I'll try to illustrate that a little bit here. And here are some illustrations of that. So this is a map, um, kind of, this is all still in progress. This is a work in progress. So this is a map of um, proposed conserved complexes among these animal species. And there's about 500 here. And the green ones represent ones that are already curated. So they're well studied. They're documented in a manually curated database of complexes. And the gray ones represent those that are biologically novel, or at least that aren't curated. So those are our predicted complexes. Um, just to, to, to lift this out a little bit um, and try to make it a little more real, you can see here that, for example, among the top complexes, a lot of them are well understood and well known. For example, the ribosome and proteasome, those are well understood. Um, but if you move a lot farther down the map into these smaller complexes, a lot more often those are really poorly researched. There's nothing at all known about them in a lot of cases, but they still seem quite plausible. So it seems like there's a lot of useful biological novelty coming out of this, and we're really making a lot of headway in mapping out the complexes. Um, this is just it's the same map. I've just colored it a bit differently, just to give you a little bit of a feel for what we can see and where we can go in looking at the data sets that we have. So I've colored the interactions here by how many species those interactions were observed in. So um, you can see even within certain complexes, we have sections of the complex that are observed across all five species, and some sections of the complex that are just observed in a couple of the species. So it starts to give us an idea of a starting point to identify interesting cases where complexes change across evolutionary timescales. And we can use similar approaches like this and similar ways of analyzing our data to look at changes in complexes even among different conditions and different tissues. Um, one more picture here. This is, um, this is another way of slicing the data that we have. So we can integrate data from all of these species and this external bi biological data we have. And instead of um, combining it together, we can make species-specific maps as well. And so that's a, another direction we're going here, and I just wanted to give you a flavor for, for that. It's still in progress, and, but it's, it's moving along quite well. So we think that'll be really helpful for modeling species-specific um, networks and, and, and understanding the biology of the different species as well. So just to wrap up, we really feel like we're at a, a tipping point now for really mapping out and understanding most of the protein complexes in a much better way. Not just for a species, but also for cell types and tissues, for different developmental stages, and even different conditions. This method allows us to really um, dive in and actually figure out how those protein interactions change. So another, uh, just kind of speaking to um, ways of collaboration and putting different kinds of knowledge that are at this meeting together, we feel like there's a lot of progress going on in protein structure inference right now, and we're really making a lot of headway with that. And if we put that protein structure inference that's making a lot of progress together with the fact that we're now able to map out a lot of these new complexes in a much broader, faster way, um, that should give us a lot of headway in really advancing this goal of making um, at least constrained models of these complexes kind of de novo. And that's what, that's what we're hoping to be able to do more and more. So that should help us make better 3D models of the cell and give us better mechanistic understanding as well. So that's it. Um, thanks very much. I just want to thank the members of the Marcot Lab, especially Dr. Marcot, Taijun, Martin, and Traver, and the Emily Lab, our, our, our collaborators in Toronto, uh, Dr. Emily, Sui Hong, and Pierre. Thanks very much. <laughs>